CDC that we share with the American Physical Society and the American Association of Physics Teachers. We're really excited about this new convening space here in Washington, D.C. Um, this is only the second big event that we've had here uh, since the last month or so, so you're very, very much welcome. Also, welcome to those of us, uh, those of you who are joining us on live stream this evening. We're really happy to have you engage with us and look forward to your future engagement. So I'm Michael Maloney. I'm CEO of AIP, the American Institute of Physics. And I'm really excited about the conversation that we're going to have this evening around the intersection of AI and physics and the future of discovery. It is a topic that comes up in our boardrooms all the time. It's a topic that comes up in our meetings, of scientific meetings. And I'm really looking forward to learning from our expert panel this evening uh, about the future discovery um, that is uh, so uh, inspirational as, as actually we were hearing from st students today at the Board of Trustees meeting with AIP Foundation. So really excited to have this convening opportunity this evening. AIP, the, this convening is one of the things that we do. We like to convene around leadership in science and technology. And as a federation of 10 member societies, societies that represent about 120,000 scientists, engineers, teachers, students, practitioners of science, physical sciences of many, many different types. We really try to engage in uniting the community around important topics, important topics in our science, important topics to our community. Our affiliates even go beyond the 120,000. If you, if you take the combined membership of our 18 affiliate organizations as well, we've got well over 300,000 members of the scientific community connected to AIP. So tonight we're really engaged in an, in an effort to think, think beyond our, 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 the way we think about having done physics for the last century or more and thinking about what this new technology might open up, the new discovery spaces that we can have uh, in the physical sciences. And that's a tremendously exciting opportunity for, for us as organizations, but also more importantly for us as a species on this planet mm -hmm. faced with considerable challenges and amazing opportunities for us. So you're part of this conversation this evening. We are really looking forward to engaging with you. We're joined tonight by members of AIP's Foundation's Board of Trustees that we're meeting earlier today, as well as some members of, our, of the AIP Board of Directors. Um, our mission at AIP is to advance, promote, and serve the physical sciences for the benefit of humanity. Um, the, war, the, the wonder that is our universe uh, that surrounds us, the physical world that surrounds us on this precious planet of ours is, is really, if you think about it, just so well demonstrated by the solar eclipse that unfortunately I missed because I was on the other side of the country. But I was incredibly <laughs> jealous of all the people who managed to get to see uh, the totality of the eclipse. And I think it just demonstrated, as we were talking about earlier today, nobody was doubting the physicists about where, total, where the full <laughs> total eclipse was. There was total trust in science. People knew where to go, and it was all fantastic. And so that was, that was a really exciting opportunity about how, how uh, trust in science is still alive and well uh, in the world, if you'd like. So at AIP, we have a number of different ways that we interact. We advance the success of our 10 member organizations. We're an institute that engages in policy research, social science research, historical research about our community, all with the aim of engaging in positive change. We are an organization that really works to promote inclusion and belonging in our community and really advance that. It's such an important topic uh, for our community and for our world. So we, tr we strive to be a thought leader as an organization. You're seeing some of that uh, thought leadership tonight. Um, we also try to engage, as I mentioned, in positive change. And one aspect that we're very proud of at the moment is our project called Team Up Together which is a project to really engage in positive change in how physics and astronomy is taught, and more importantly, the lived experience of the student and how that can be, uh, how we engage in systemic change so the lived experience of the student really drives inclusion and belonging in our community. So take a look at teamoftogether.org if you want to, want to learn more. I want to thank all of you in the audience and those online who are our donors who help us make make a difference in the world and engage in advancing, promoting, and serving the physical science to benefit of humanity. And I'm going to, more importantly, stop talking now and hand over to our moderator this evening. We are incredibly privileged to have such a 
amazing board of trustees helping lead the philanthropic support of AIP um, and, and the work that we do to, to engage in positive change. And we're even more privileged to have as our inaugural chair of the AIP Foundation Board of Trustees, uh, the Honorable Fr Dr. France Cordova. France really goes without introduction, but she was the 14th director of the National Science Foundation, former president of Purdue University, former chief scientist at NASA. I could go on probably for the next hour about France's resume. <laughs> Just call me former. <laughs> <laughs> She's currently the president of the Science Philanthropy <laughs> Alliance, which does an amazing work with philanthropic foundations from across the country who are supporting science. Um, and that's an amazing work that's so important to the future of our science. So, France, thank you again for this evening and for your work with AIP, and I hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. So, uh, good evening, everyone. We're just really thrilled that you're with us tonight. We're hoping to that this will be a very interactive kind of discussion. So, here's the thought for the evening. Can brewers use AI to make better beer? <laughs> that, is, th that is actually the title of an article that appeared in the illustrious Science Magazine in their March 27th issue. All right. So we're going to explore similar <laughs> related issues tonight. All right. We might not get to beer exactly, but, uh, but we'll see the power of, uh, of AI. So welcome to this event sponsored by the AIP Foundation. While it's conceivable in the future that AIP could stand for artificial intelligent physicists, <laughs> <laughs> for this evening, AIP is the venerable American Institute of Physics. So we're pleased to have you join in the fun of discussing something much in the news, which is generative AI. And it's, it's just amazing, isn't it, how everything you attend, everywhere you go, there's AI in the title. In fact, I encourage students, if they want to have people come to their discussion session at, say, the AAAS or whatever, that just put AI somewhere in the title and you'll get a, you'll get a big audience. So, in fact, in a forthcoming important report from Elsevier, 115 leaders of academic institutions and research institutions were interviewed about the challenges ahead. And when they were asked to identify the biggest challenges, uh, they identified two things, AI and climate change. That was worldwide <coughs> survey. It seems that AI is just everywhere, like a playful phantom, or a worrisome one, depending on your point of view, right? So today we have four notable scientists and engineers from all sectors of the research enterprise, industry, government, university, and philanthropy, who are going to give you a flavor of their outlook on AI. And you'll have the opportunity to ask them about questions about AI that keep you up at night, like uh, one that my spouse and I ask is, Alexa, listening to our conversations? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Somebody just said yes. Uh, you, you can. So you have uh, the bios of our speakers. Let me just give you uh, just a sentence on each. So uh, Walt Copan, and I'm, ju I'm just going to go right here from my right, uh, is, was the 16th director of NIST. And we had a great time serving together the federal <laughs> government. Just great and currently Vice President for Research and Technology Transfer at the Colorado School of Mines. Sitting next to him is Valerie Browning, who's the Vice President of Research and Technology at Lockheed Martin and um, an AIP Board of Directors member. And then uh, sitting next to her is Jesse Thaler, Director of uh, NSF's AI Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, and he's a professor at MIT. And then we have Yevgeny Gusev, who's Senior Director of Engineering at Qualcomm Research and Chairman of Tiny ML. we'll have to find out what that's about, <laughs> Foundation, and AIP Foundation Board of Trustees mem uh, member. Okay, so let me ask them the first question, and I'll first turn to Jesse and ask, how is artificial intelligence, 
currently being used in physics research, because this is, as you know from the title, this is about physics and, and how AI is influencing uh, the present and the future of physics. And what are some notable advancements? Yeah, well, thanks, Franz. And uh, uh, as director of an AI institute, uh, I am very tempted to tell you about all the amazing things that our 25 faculty and 100 <laughs> postdocs and graduate students are doing across the spectrum of uh, AI and physics. So I'll have to limit myself just to a couple of examples. Um, but maybe just to start, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and physics intelligence, they can go together. And actually, the uh, insights that physicists can bring to the AI sphere and the insights that the AI sphere can bring to the physics domain, it really is a, a synergy. And uh, I started off as being very skeptical about what AI could do. I remember in 2016, people were talking about the deep learning revolution. And I said, look, I'm a theoretical physicist. I'd work on my chalk and chalkboard. What I do is I do deep thinking. Okay? <laughs> but then realizing that the deep thinking that we've done, time-tested strategies in physics, can merge together with the deep learning uh, strategies for processing large data sets. And that's led to a number of advances. So let me just give you three examples from our institute. So in the world of theoretical physics, um, one of the things that we'd like to do is we'd like to understand the strong nuclear force. And right now, 10% of all open supercomputing resources in the US are devoted to solving the equations of lattice QCD. And uh, um, some of my colleagues at our AI Institute are actually using AI techniques, uh, kind of a type of generative AI, in order to accelerate these type of processes, such that not only can you actually do first principles calculations of hydrogen and helium, but you can start marching your way up the periodic table and actually understand nuclear physics much better. In the experimental domain, people know about big data, and I'm someone who uh, works a lot with the Large Hadron Collider. But looking to the future, in the US, one of the strategic areas that the US is investing in is in a ghostly particle called the neutrino. And there is a, uh, a planned experiment uh, being built right now where beams of neutrinos are going to be sent from Fermilab to a mine in South Dakota. And the detector technology used there is called liquid argon time projection chambers. And that technology gives you exquisite access to information about what these neutrinos are doing. But remarkably, and somehow they, they anticipated that AI was going to be there, you can't actually process all the data coming out of these large TPCs. And you can't actually do the reconstruction unless you have AI techniques. And so now we're in a situation where to process, it's not a lot of data, it's just very complex data coming from these detectors to try to understand neutrino properties. Um, we actually really need AI techniques for the event reconstruction. And so those are both examples in kind of theoretical physics, experimental physics, but what about the other direction? Um, how can physicists actually influence AI research? And uh, you know, as a physicist, you see some very complicated system that you don't understand. Well, come on, we know that. You know, quantum antibody physics is also complex and, and difficult to understand. So what if you take the techniques that we know from physics and now try to apply it to solve some challenges or uh, puzzles in the AI space? And one of the ones that I like a lot is this bizarre phenomena that was noted in the machine learning literature, a phenomenon called grokking. Okay, so grokking in the machine learning context is something where you have a machine learning uh, algorithm. It's running, it's running, it's running, and it's not learning anything. It's memorizing the data, but it doesn't have an understanding. But you let it go overnight, and then suddenly it has an epiphany. And you're like, well, what the heck is that going on? Well, but to physicists, we understand sudden changes. We call them phase transitions. And indeed, what happens in this grokking phenomena is you have a gas of information that suddenly crystallizes into knowledge. And when I say crystallize, I really mean there's a lattice structure that emerges in the latent space of a machine learning architecture. And you know, leave it to physicists to take <laughs> this machine learning concept and then actually have a physics way of understanding uh, what, what's going on. So you know, these are just some of the examples um, that are happening at our AI Institute. Um, but I'm quite bullish about the direction this field is going. Yeah. And uh, it's definitely the direction that the next generation wants to go. And you know, I'm holding on for dear life when I have uh, you know, my, my, my junior colleagues who are dragging me deeper and deeper into, uh, into this deep learning uh, world. And uh, yeah, that's some fact, of the things that are going on in this space. In fact, I think you, you told me a little earlier this evening that it, in the that you literally were dragged into this world that you had distrust of. I, I did, um, and I had these two graduate students come into my office, and they showed me their machine learning paper that was a direct competition to my work. I had slaved over understanding how to do quantum field theory calculations. I had my idea, and here they are coming in with some convolutional neural network. And I told them all the things that were wrong with their paper. I said, no, you, this is not right. It's not interpretable. You, know, you don't have the uncertainties. You don't even have an understanding of the concepts that are involved. And I thought they'd never see me again. <laughs> and they walk out of my office and work with someone else for their PhD. 
Uh, but instead, uh, they came back and their PhD theses are basically answering all of my concerns. Mm -hmm. And that we should not just take AI off the shelf and use it as is. If we're physicists, we need yeah. to adapt those methods to the uh, physics domain yeah. and include all the things that we have for our, for our high standards of scientific discovery. You know how lucky they were. <laughs> <laughs> So, Waltz, how, how would you answer that question? There are so many ways that we see artificial intelligence just absolutely coexisting with physics research, from experimental design to being so much more productive with regard to the hardware of physics experiments. Um, uh, so I used to be the director at NIST, and I also was at Brookhaven National Lab, and so when you think about uh, big physics experiments, big quantum experiments, uh, you also think about how do you actually set up and control these exquisite uh, laser uh, experiments on, on really complex optical tables, uh, or, um, or how do you shape uh, beams and particle accelerators so that they deliver exactly what they need at the um, energy distribution that they need to have. And these are artificially, uh, artificial intelligence control systems uh, that, uh, that are enabling these uh, uh, experimental setups that used to take graduate students, in many cases, for simpler experiments, months to set up and get the optics all properly aligned. And now AI is a tool to enable these. Um, I remember also, Franz, uh, when you were director at NIST, I was uh, rather at NSF and I was at NIST, um, and the first image came out of the black hole. <laughs> Um, and what an exciting moment this was for astrophysics and, and uh, just understanding our, our universe. Um, and as we've seen, the, the experimentation to discover those images, the pattern recognition that AI offers, together with machine learning uh, types of systems, to understand our universe and to look more deeply at what's actually happening with that black hole, these uh, AI-enabled image enhancements, and also the discovery of exoplanets. So exoplanets are normally discovered because of the uh, variations in, uh, in intensity of, of the signals coming uh, from, uh, from, from the stars, um, and, uh, and when the planet uh, obstructs a portion of the beam. So there's a pattern recognition phenomenon in time that artificial intelligence is absolutely suited to find. And, uh, and, and so there's over 5,000 exoplanets that have been discovered throughout uh, the universe thus far. Artificial intelligence was at the heart of finding and validating so many of them. And some of them were suspected. Um, and so you have this ability to take pattern recognition, but also bring the human dimension of discovery um, and, and the opportunity to enhance the pace of, of physics research, the discovery process, especially where massive amounts of data are involved, including uh, the Large Hadron Collider types of experiments, or what we anticipate from the uh, Electron-Ion Collider experiments at, uh, at Brookhaven. Um, and the last thing I'd, I'd like to say is that when it comes to experimental design, the ability to use algorithms that are based on fundamental quantum theory um, and then be able to use those, uh, those algorithms to not only validate test results uh, and experimental results, uh, but also to turn it around the other way and say, how should I design this experiment to validate or disprove this portion of the theory? And, uh, and, and so uh, this interaction now that we're seeing between human and machine and the interactivity, especially in areas like astrophysics, um, are, uh, are truly exciting frontiers uh, for, uh, for our scientific productivity in the years to come. So, so you, like Jesse, are um, at, at a big uh, research university. Yep. Do, do you see your students really um, getting more involved with this in the discovery process? Not in answering questions on a take-home exam or something, <laughs> but actually you know, using it for their PhD thesis. We do. It's, uh, it, it's a tool just like decades ago. The calculator was seen as this thing that would destroy understanding of mathematics. That's uh, right. right? Uh, and, and, and we just have a new reality now where, where these are the basic tools 
<laughs> whereby science is, uh, is being conducted. And so having AI literate grad students and, and uh, to the undergraduate level, um, these are the people who are gonna be advancing um, the applications of AI and physics and vice versa, uh, advancing physics through AI. Mm -hmm. There's probably also AI illiteracy, but we can talk about that. We'll talk that. about that separately, yeah. yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, Yevgeny, so it seems like from uh, these previous two folks that, um, that, uh, that physicists really do um, have a, a contribution to make using, uh, using AI. Do you have a perspective on that from the I industry perspective? What is, what is your experience and what is your projection of how that's going to look? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Evgeny Gusev. I'm actually re representing a uh, Silicon Valley bubble of AI. So, <laughs> 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 so if you have any concerns or issues about AI, just complain to me and my friends and we'll take care of this. But seriously speaking, what do we do? We develop leading edge, edge technologies, both hardware, algorithm, software, all the tools that people use for their scientific research. And I think I, I agree with Walt and Jesse that you can think simplistically about AI as a tool that allows you, as a lens that allows you to see beyond your uh, naked eye type of vision. So especially when it comes to large uh, amount of data uh, to be able to do it in many areas, astronomy, nuclear fusion, uh, molecular dynamics, many, many areas. I think ML and AI is becoming a very common tool in, in scientific research, which is actually a very exciting field now for, for academics, because you can use these tools and solve them to the problems. So back kind of to your question, uh, friends, about physics and AI, I think where we are today in the AI development is it's very immature. We are talking AI as a, as a kind of a toddler type of guy. In fact, some, some people estimate what AI can do today is equivalent to maybe like a three, four years old kid. Just kind of to give you an example, uh, you can uh, teach a teenager to drive a car and it will take probably about 10 hours for a teenager to learn how to drive a car. So we, and I think Jason, you know, we have <laughs> billions of dollars and many, many years of research for autonomous driving and we're not there yet because the technology is actually it's, it's quite dumb I, I, in a way. So there's more things to do and, and kind of if you, dig deeper into the technology level and kind of what is under the hood, we are basically running some very basic probabilistic type of equations there. We're doing matrix multiplication and uh, there are some kind of techniques to do it. And that's kind of where the physics can bring the value. I think we see more and more in the AI space, uh, in the development space, that the, the brute force approach is running out of steam, this probabilistic approach. People are bringing more and more uh, physics type of approach, like based on free energy type of calculations, uh, energy-based equations, and really bring more explainability in, 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 into AI and make it more and more energy efficient from this perspective. Again, a lot of opportunities. If you go to more recent AI conferences, people bring, bring more and more uh, physics type of concepts there, again, for the reasons to make it better understandable, more efficient. And there are some terms people use like entropy, entropy, temperature <laughs> in, in AI. Like temperature, just to give you a scale in AI, temperature used from one to zero. One means that, uh, zero means that your system, AI system is cool, it behaves well. If it approaches one, it's basically in the chaotic state, it's going out of, out of control. So, so that's kind of people use the physics uh, in a way to, to, to think about AI. Kind of a lot of opportunities there for physics to contribute to AI, but also for physicists like people in this room and people on, on, online really to think about this. How do we be, can become of this AI revolution and may, make, make a big difference there to make it more explainable, more reliable, and kind of develop things like what people have, like common sense type of things, and not, not just mm -hmm. kind of probabilistic, like you, you know, one, like all the current models, Gen AI type of models, LLM models, they're basically text-based models, so they train on text, you know, like the previous text, and you can predict what the next word is going to be, these kind of predictive things. But there is no much explainability there, and, and that will become super, super important as we move forward probably in the next decade, and that's where this community, the physics community, can bring a big role there. That's kind of from a science perspective, but I think the other thing, what is also important, I'm a physicist myself by training, which I'm very fortunate that I have a high school teacher who, <laughs> who, was, who I admired basically, and that's, so that's why I became a physicist. And um, uh, by training, we are physicists, we are people who are trained to solve problems and to connect dots. And I think that's, in my opinion, the pieces that is missing in the whole AI space. Because people do a lot of software coding, just pretty much without thinking and doing these things. So we need to have people who will bring more thinking into this area 
and connect dots and to be, to be able to kind of work on problem solving rather than the brute force of approach. So yeah, a lot of excitement, a lot of opportunities for physics and for the physicists to contribute to this big AI revolution and make it reasonable and scalable. <laughs> So you, you mentioned the, the bubble, the Silicon Valley bubble, yes. that, and you, you are in this bubble. Yes, I right? am <laughs> in the middle of the bubble. <laughs> okay. So, so give, give us a little bit more texture on, on the bubble, what the bubble looks like. Do people actually talk to each other across the different, or are they keeping everything very close, or uh, you know, in the, in the different companies and all? Uh, uh, I think in the Silicon Valley, you see a lot of race. Uh, companies kind of uh, trying to be ahead of the competition there people don't really think about safeguards, any consequences, kind of the, the mentality of the Bay Area is let's just break it and then someone is going to figure out and clean up this mess. Oh, so that, 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 that's yeah. kind of, uh, and it's okay. driven more by the venture companies trying to pour a lot of money into this and all the, most of the a AI companies in the Bay Area are not really making money today yet. Mm -hmm. It's kind mm -hmm. of all the valuation is based mm -hmm. on the hype. Mm -hmm. That's kind of my I, mind. I, I see Vince Cerf here kind of smirking, so we'll have to get, we'll have to get your view of the internet. I'm you know, as father of the internet, we, well, we I, need your view I mean, this is, this is one side of the, uh, of the yeah. Silicon Valley, but don't take it wrong. There is a lot of innovations happen there, also on okay. the technology side, hardware sure. side, all these kind of things. It's kind of, it's the race uh, to be the first. That's what creates this kind of yeah. bubble and momentum. And it's well, that's a good lead into my next question, which is for Valerie, is about the acceleration. Is um, do, do you think, uh, in you know, coming from uh, being in the industry world, do you think that a AI is accelerating uh, discovery in physics, or is it? Uh, I mean, what is what does that all look like, or is that just incremental uh, advancement, or the real is there real movement there? And and what do you see as a result? Is kind of do you see risk involved in that acceleration? Yeah, so as a point of reference, one of my uh, former DARPA colleagues, he's still a DARPA colleague, I'm not, uh, was recently quoted as saying that approximately 70% of the roughly $3 billion budget that they are investing in R&D is either leveraging AI or advancing AI. And as you've already heard from other panelists, uh, lots of examples of how we are leveraging AI as a computational tool to uh, accelerate. I mean, that's, that's how it was decided, this discovery. So I think we're already there in terms of, of AI accelerating um, discovery. Uh, where I, I, what I'm excited about, uh, particularly over what's happened over the last couple years and uh, where I think we, we could go, um, if this, had in, this conversation had happened even three to five years ago, I would have started off by claiming that machine learning is a misnomer. We have machine training, right? But uh, the reality is with uh, you know, large language models, generative AI, we are moving in a direction where I think AI is moving from a very valuable tool towards more of a collaborator you know, that, that, that will further accelerate. And some of the things, some, a couple specific areas where I think there is some real promise uh, in, in moving in that direction is uh, at the intersection of quantum computing and machine learning. Hmm. Uh, the massive parallelism that uh, comes with the, um, with the quantum computing uh, really pairs very well from superposition and, and entanglement very well with uh, some of the challenge problems that we would like to bring machine learning to with the massive data sets and the very complex spaces. Uh, and I think it's true that there is opportunity there even in sort of the near-term horizon, not, you know, even with the uncertainties of when, when or if we will ever get to general purpose quantum computing with our noisy interme intermediate scale quantum computing, I think there's some, some real opportunities to look at some hard problems, um, climate, um, ma uh, materials discovery, uh, leveraging research that's being done at the intersection. And the other one where I think there's some real promise is at the intersection of physics informed neural networks and machine learning as well. Um, the ability to sort of bake in the physics into these, um, these approximations and, again, tackle some really uh, hard uh, problems, which physicists can, you know, they're, they're, we think about these problems and we can bring those, pro those problems that, that, uh, that um, you know, can't readily be uh, t uh, tackled using classical systems. I think there's some real opportunity there. So to me, the, the, what I'm really excited about are these sort of 
you know, areas where we, I think we're really evolving AI from a very valuable computational tool, but to a more valuable um, uh, partner. So. Mm -hmm. So at Lockheed Martin, you, you're the vice president of all this stuff. So what, um, what, what, how are you, how are you moving the troops? What are, are yeah, so and I did, and I'll talk about the, the risk here a little bit too to, to, to finish the question. So just to, to level set, I am not the vice president <laughs> at Lockheed Martin. There are 300 vice presidents. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I am the vice president for the corporate research and technology. And, uh, and we do have, we are investing in AIML. At the, a lot of what we're doing is looking to really apply it to practical um, practical uh, challenge problems. Um, but um, so in that vein, the risk, I don't, I don't think that they're, they're, we have to worry so much about risk in terms of AI applied to discovery. It, there's nothing about it that, that really negates the need for the due diligence and, and the, the, you know, the scientific method. It's, it's when, when you, you are developing you know, AI-enabled insights and you're tr starting to try to reduce them to practice, which is what we do in our business, and you start bringing that engineering to that, uh, you know, the, 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 the models or the insights that were developed using the AI ML tools uh, may have been valid in certain regimes or they may come with certain constraints, and if that doesn't get flowed into the engineering process, then, you, then there is risk there. And so a lot of what we do, and particularly in our industry where the risk of making a mistake uh, can be very severe, life-threatening, mm -hmm. um, we, we have to bring that, you know, that engineering rigor and understand how to, to really do um, t test, evaluation, validation, and verification. And that is a real challenge problem in, in, this, in this space when you're trying to make sure that you are anticipating all of the edge cases that you might see mm -hmm. in a very dynamic uh, and um, you know, potentially a resource-constrained environment. So, so that's where, where I really see the risk, and, and that's really some of the challenge problems that, that we are looking at uh, specifically with our investments. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, you're in a different domain. Uh, you've been in government, now you're in, at the university. So where, where do you see the, the acceleration and the risk at, uh, on a university campus? Uh, it uh, really winds up being a, a fantastic series of tools for, uh, for advancing the, uh, the research process and telling uh, uh, and validating hypotheses. Um, on the risk side, it's a, it's a trust but verify type of situation, right? Um, uh, and uh, I, I mentioned the discovery of uh, exoplanets and the use of AI in, in that regime. Uh, the accuracy of that um, uh, discovery process was over 96%. Uh, and, and so when you look at, well, what are, the, what are the deviations here and what can we learn from what is not being predicted or where we see a false positive, uh, those are just great opportunities for learning and for enhancement. Um, uh, NIST, of course, has an important role with regard to artificial intelligence and standards, uh, trustworthy uh, AI. And one of the things I believe is very, very important for a range of applications is to have um, test beds where uh, uh, artificial intelligence protocols uh, can be validated and their, uh, their uh, accuracy independently verified. And so to have these opportunities uh, so that you're not having uh, kind of a massive hallucination type of event as we've heard about with artificial intelligence, that opportunity to use the scientific method as several of us have said and, and to validate the directions. Um, we see so often in the, in the world of physics and astrophysics and even with the uh, predictions uh, about the eclipse and its timing, a lot of those validations were, are being done now using artificial intelligence routines that helps to fine tune our understanding and in some cases some of the deviations uh, with regard to uh, gravitational phenomena and others. So it, uh, it's an exciting way as, as, uh, as you were saying, Valerie, that uh, AI truly becomes a partner in the research enterprise. Um, and then also in the engineering side as we're taking what we learn in some domains and say how do we de-risk these things uh, to ensure that the product performance um, and system level performance is going to be as promised. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so con 
continuing on the, the thread of, uh, uh, of education in, in university environments, Jesse, what, how, how do you find a AI is being used at MIT to um, help in the educational mission and maybe the outreach to the community? What are some of the things that are being done there? So it's interesting because you see on our campus uh, a divide between the people who are enthusiastic about AI and the ostriches. <laughs> the ostriches who are just putting your head in the sand and saying, oh, this is not going to be relevant. And uh, there's been a, a variety of fora that have happened at MIT surrounding generative AI in the <coughs> educational context. And one of, the, one of the best pieces of advice that I got from one of those fora was uh, someone who said, Look, as, as faculty, step one is to just do something. Step two is to do something good. But if we aren't bringing these tools into the classroom, then we're basically not doing our job as faculty to yeah. teach. And, uh, and then once you bring it into the classroom and you really think about, well, like uh, with, with the, the example of a calculator, what type of exam do you write when you force the student to use a calculator? What type of essay do you write when you force the student to use generative AI? It really changes the process. So if you think about some of the things that are really challenging, let's say in the research space, you have an undergraduate comes into the lab, uh, let's say they want to work at LIGO, and then you think about what is the documentation for LIGO in order to understand things, there are giant amounts of technical reports. Um, but what if you can actually have a, a chat GPT style chatbot that can answer a question for a student about how to run that particular piece of code, or even have that chatbot actually generate example code. And so some of my MIT colleagues are actually developing that and it turns out to be an incredible learning resource uh, because students who might otherwise have a difficult time asking questions and not even know how to pose their questions, they can interact with a chatbot in order to actually find out uh, answers to things that otherwise are buried in, in, in technical literature. Um, when it comes to outreach, um, you know, we had done, b before November of 2022, uh, we had done some outreach at the part of the Cambridge Science Festival to try to explain to, to people kind of what AI was doing in terms of like problems like classification. But once you had chat GPT, um, the outreach possibilities grew in a way that was quite surprising. And the way that I found out about this was uh, at an April Fool's joke at my expense. Uh, so you've all heard of chat GPT. Uh, but uh, have you heard of Chat Jesse T? <laughs> and so you can go to chatjessyt.com and you can interact with a chatbot that knows all of my papers, knows my Wikipedia entry, knows my web page, and speaks very enthusiastically about physics and AI. Um, and what the, the students and postdocs at MIT had done is that they had used retrieval augmented generation, that's basically a drawing from a trusted corpus of text, plus some prompt engineering in order to generate a chatbot that, well, first you say, well, that's, that's interesting, amusing, again, kind of a joke at my expense, but then you think about, well, how can I actually use this in an educational context? Mm -hmm. And so, okay, I'm not the most famous physicist uh, that you know, so maybe not, no one wants to hear my chatbot, but certainly uh, people at, uh, at the Cambridge Science Festival were very interested to talk to J. Robin Oppenheimer, uh, a tool that we called OpenAI Mer. Uh, and again, with the same idea, you take all of Oppenheimer's papers, so it knows about the born Oppenheimer approximation and can give you answers about of technical concepts, but also um, prompt engineered in order to you know, talk about some of obviously the, the issues at the intersection of, of society and, and, and physics. And so bringing that to the Cambridge Science Festival as a tool where the, where the people at the festival could type something into the chatbot, see what Oppenheimer said, but then talk to the physicist next door and say, well, is this a hallucination? Is this real? And then actually starts a dialogue that otherwise was, was harder to have if you didn't have that, that tool there. And so I see you know, examples like that as, as showing, you know, I'm not someone who necessarily thought that language models would be relevant for my physics research, uh, but certainly uh, it's something that's relevant for communicating physics, both to, to novices who are learning about things and then also to, uh, to, to people who are in the informed public who want to know more about this. Um, but then, uh, let me just kind of close this saying, you have these students now who are, who are learning how to use these large language models and they want to use it for scientific discovery. And again, if I put on my curmudgeon side, oh, you'll never be able to use language models for scientific discovery, the language of physics is equations, you know, with that. But then realizing that actually we have a ton of data in the form of text. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that a summer school student, actually a high school student did, uh, was interact with a database of Hubble images 
where you have the images from Hubble plus the proposals that were used to justify the telescope time. Mm -hmm. And that's a coordination between textual data mm -hmm. and image data. And you can put those together using certain types of foundation model techniques and actually have a new way of interacting with a scientific data set. And so something that, again, felt like a little bit like a joke, oh, just for outreach, or felt like a cheat <laughs> for getting information, actually now starts to be seen, it now has really scientific value. And I feel like these things are going to kind of, kind of swirl and converge, and we're all going to realize, maybe, as physicists to our chagrin, that actually language is a pretty powerful way of communication. And generative AI is a way for us to enter into that. And it's a, it's a language that is spoken not just by technical experts, but also by the public. And that's why I see that there might actually be more opportunities for dialogue. Mm. So will we all have a chat, whatever, chat wall, chat <laughs> avatar, chat Michael, you know, et cetera? Um, that, I, I hope you all do. It's actually really fun. To do. <laughs> but, but, but even more so than that, what people are realizing. On April 1st. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> but, but I think what people are realizing is that these, these bots, um, the way that they behave, they're, they're driven by design decisions. That someone has decided how they're going to behave. OK, so let's design it in a way that we think is to our benefit. Um, and so my wife, who uh, is a lawyer, uh, she has her prompt engineered version so that when she asks certain types of legal questions, she gets it in the format that's useful for her professionally. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just having you know, <laughs> the chat Jesse T, it's also having the bot that's customized for the thing that we need and really seeing it as a tool that we can program ourselves, even if we don't have programming expertise, program ourselves to do various tasks that otherwise would be quite onerous to do by hand. Very exciting. So while well, you led a big, um, uh, agency, NIST, a very important, unique agency. What are the key uh, uh, policy considerations now if you were doing that? Uh, I mean, we, when we were in government, AO was just, there, there was a lot of stuff going on in the White House, a lot of convening on AO, but it was nowhere near where it is today, okay, in its capability because of the whole generative AI sort of revolution in the last couple of years. Um, what are the considerations in, in funding uh, AI initiatives and some of the sort of the big thinking around opportunities and risks there? Yeah. Well, um, I, and I think you said it well, Valerie, that, um, that uh, an agency like DARPA is seeing AI in 70% of its funded uh, opportunities. So uh, it's with us. Um, funding agencies are seeing that uh, the value proposition that is being articulated in the proposal for funding and, and the scientific method that's going to be utilized to achieve the results that are being proposed and, and, and the research body um, uh, will, I believe, start to question if researchers are, are actually not utilizing artificial intelligence as a tool uh, to actually enable their results to be achieved in a way that's cost effective um, and that ultimately develops models that can be scalable and, uh, and utilized uh, for other purposes. So I think we truly have uh, been within a re revolutionary shift with regard to the federal uh, science and technology investment uh, uh, it always takes time for policy and regulation to catch up with the reality of, uh, of the um, scale and pace of movement of, uh, of scientific discovery and, and technology, and that's a natural tension. Uh, but the United States' purpose is to be the global leader in artificial intelligence. Um, and so as we see the um, um, opportunities across all science agencies, um, these will clearly be uh, tempered with the awareness of, as we've been talking about, uh, certain the risks, the requirement to validate, the requirement to utilize scientific process uh, as, uh, as part of that validation. Uh, but also, we are at a time um, as a nation where um, not only within the scientific enterprise, but in our labor force, that we're having dramatic challenges of, of filling gaps um, whether it's in advanced manufacturing and, uh, and, and you name the sector, there's a, there's a workforce issue. Um, and so to the extent that the United States can also utilize artificial intelligence 
um, as a force multiplier, as an enabler, as a driver of efficiencies within the economy. Uh, these are other areas that the United States, as we're looking at, uh, at policy implications and policy drivers, also must take into account uh, as we're looking at the, the balance of our trained workforce, uh, the uh, requirements for the future, as well as the specific outcomes of the scientific enterprise. So there's an increased level of comfort with artificial intelligence being part of the federal funding landscape. So here's the question that I, I worry about. It's for, it's for Valerie and Yevgeny coming from the industry sectors. Um, I, I see uh, just how much, how many tools it takes to really do um, AI experimentation like GPUs would be a very expensive tool. And then I see companies like NVIDIA that I know pretty well, um, uh, some of the people there and what's going on and, um, and how much it costs to uh, put up data centers and create GPUs. And then I see the enormous demand that centers like Jesse Center and many of the NSF funded AI centers have the GPUs, and they can just get a few, you know, a couple here, a few there, and, um, uh, but, uh, you know, because there's such a demand for these things, and so it just seems to me, we, I don't think we ever as a country want to be in a position where industry has all the marbles, right? I mean, we, we, we need to have, universities need to have these tools, they're very expensive, they're, they're undersourced, you know, it just costs a lot to produce them. So I'd like your perspective on what you think is going to happen there and where there are potential breakthroughs so that um, institutes like uh, Jesse's Institute and all the other AI institutes going up uh, can just get their hands on more. They can just make incredible advancement if they can have more of these tools. Yeah. So I was talking with a colleague of mine about this, and he found a, a plot that I found really interesting. So the challenge in getting access is not just in, in the academic and the R&D community. The, 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 the difference in GPU access between the really big companies and some of the startups who are, you know, is, is multiple orders of magnitude. Uh, and we're, as you all know, we're in a particular time right now where, um, you know, the generative AI and the large language models have really, and, and other factors, have, have created a demand, a, a demand that is, has exceeded available supply. So, um, you know, I, I, I view that as that maybe a short, shorter term problem. We are seeing the, um, the wait times for these uh, beginning to shrink. But, but I think th this, where we are right now, is actually exacerbating a much broader and longer standing problem in terms of inequities in high power computing and including yeah. GPUs access at our yeah. academic institutions. And for me, you know, one of the major problems with that is it really creates an inequity in terms of experiential learning for the students, yeah. right? And, and you know, a, a student that, can, that has that, that access and can work on some very challenging real world problems uh, then has some ex experience that can really open doors, at, you know, for you know, postdocs and, and other areas that that may not present themselves to students who are working on toy problems because they don't have uh, ha that <coughs> access. So, uh, I, 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 it is a problem that needs a lot of focus and it needs a lot of um, consideration and investment and resources. I will say that with the Chips Act, the chi the the, the um, Science and Chip and uh, Chips uh, Science Act. Uh, there is, you know, like for instance, two billion dollars going into uh, um, NSF for NAI and Quantum Center, and there are explicit provisions in there to uh, motivate and incentivize proposals that share access with those that 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 normally would not have the, the similar amount. And and there are new HPC centers that are coming out of that, uh, both both at NSF and DOE. So. I think as a country, we recognize that it is a problem. Are we doing everything that we can? Um, there's probably more that needs to be done, and 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 not, and we and we need to do more in the time frame where it's going to actually make a difference for these students. So, mm -hmm. so you're going to work on it. At <laughs> I I am an advocate for it. Absolutely, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, several comments to make here. Uh, I think first of all, as I mentioned earlier, we today we live in the overhype mode. Of, of AI, 
So basically everything is overhyped, prices, volumes, order, people order crazy amount of GPUs just, just in case, uh, uh, some of them. Uh, that's one. Uh, second is, um, to me, AI is not like one size fits all. You really need to know what you're using AI for, basically not from the, from the GPU compute down, but you need to really approach it from the problem you're trying to solve and, uh, and do it in a, in a very smart way. And there are two parts of AI in general. One part is um, training, for this you need GPUs to train your models. But the other part of AI is inferencing. How, how do you classify the problem you're trying to do? I think the example that uh, Walt mentioned earlier, you can classify images. So for image classification, you don't really need to train your model every time and use GPUs. The model can be trained once, yeah. and then you can use it every time. And this can be done without cloud. You can do it at, at the edge. You can do it in your desktop com computer. You can take TM images of a lattice and you can classify defects there very, very efficiently, very, very effectively. That's what we call edge AI. So I think today there is a little bit of misconception because people automatically associate AI with ChatGPT. And if it's ChatGPT, it's open AI. If mm -hmm. it's open AI, that's NVIDIA. So it's basically <laughs> that, that, that creates this a tri trillion, what is a seven magni magnificent club because they basically everyone pointed to each other and, and helping each other to evaluate into this crazy space. But kind of for us physicists, it's again, we need to approach it differently. We, we need to approach it, what are we using it for as a tool? Because it's a tool. And what, what tool we are going to use for what, what, what type of problem? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that kind of yeah. brings me to this kind of continuum of AI. You have the cloud AI, you have the edge AI, and you have the tiny ML AI. And again, fundamentally, all AI is a tool um, to make sense of a lot of data. And where is the data? The data is not in the cloud. The data is in the physical world. All the data in the cloud is pretty much already consumed by, by, the, by the GPT type of models. So there's a lot of data in the real world, and that's kind of where we need to have AI mm -hmm. to make this, collect this data, make it, make it actionable. And, and that's, uh, there is a lot of kind of energy efficiency happening there. So how do you make it actionable, efficient, just like the humans? I mean, a human brain consumes 20 watts of power, and we can do very complex uh, tasks. Uh, GPUs can consume uh, uh, megawatts of power <laughs> and, and they're super inefficient, right? And they don't do as mm -hmm. well as humans. So I, I, I think my answer to this question is to make it affordable. It's kind of start from the problem. I mean, the, the hype is going to cool down, obviously. We see more capacity coming. We see more startups coming into the space because it's an opportunity mm -hmm. for people to develop new approaches, new innovations, new techniques, new hardware, more efficient algorithms. So I think all of this kind of from the ecosystem perspective, including HAI and tiny ML as the ultimate energy and efficiency thing is going to help it. That's kind of one way to answer it. The other one for the cloud providers like uh, Google, NVIDIA, those people, they have special programs working with universities kind of to, to promote this type of usage of these techniques. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm optimistic. It's going to cool down and it's going to be more, more affordable. Thank you. Can, can yeah, I just, just open up a, of a, something that would be interesting to, as a physics research problem? Um, you know, we physicists, we're used to having problems at, at, at different scales. And we actually know that when problems get really, really, really big, they get simple again. <laughs> um, and thermodynamics is an example of this. Phase, phase transition. Phase transition, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so it is actually known that as you take certain types of neural networks bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, they require more and more and more and more compute. But then they reduce to very simple type of statistical inference. And so there's this question whether physicists can figure out how can you do you know, something like non-equilibrium thermodynamics for machine learning systems and actually figure out how to burn the candle from the other way as opposed to trying to you know, build the gas in this room, you know, molecule by molecule by molecule, start from the other way, start from the thermodynamic limit and look from deviations from, from the thermodynamic limit. If we can figure out that, then we might actually be able to do at scale but with much cheaper compute. And it, it's, that's an example where, where physicists have a chance to really make a breakthrough. And, and in case you think that, oh, wait, no, come on, physics concepts can't be used for machine learning at all. Just, just you know, the same technology that is you know, being used to generate deep fake videos, it, it's based on diffusion models. And diffusion really is a physical process. Yep. So it really is that already in these systems, physics is playing a role. Yep. And for this case of, of kind of efficiency, uh, you can hope that someone comes up with the, 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 the thermodynamics of machine learning, and that might actually save us from needing to buy for our AI Institute. Um, <laughs> more GPUs. That, that's great. I, I, I wish I could go back to school and you'd be my <laughs> that's, that's so inspiring. Just what a great way to go. So I want to open this up now to the audience to, uh, to hear your questions. So uh, we, have, uh, we have some questions here. 
Uh, yeah, let, let me start, Sandeep, with the question that way in the back here. And please identify yourself and where you're, uh, you know, something about yourself where you're from. Hi. Yeah. Um, my name is Sophie, and I'm a patient in Vietnam, which is a place in Uh, so the answer is no, um, <laughs> but and then you can ask kind of why. So let, let, yeah, so, so let, let's take education. Let's take education as an example. So if I forget how many years ago when people were starting talking about kind of uh, MOOCs, the, these massively something online courses, you know, why did that not take off in the in the in the same way? And you know, why didn't that completely disrupt the way that universities operated? Um, and it, and it's a good question. Um, and there is, you know. The, the thing that might be different and the thing that might be able to scale, and people would disagree with me on this, is the, interact, the potential interactive nature of learning with these tools. You know, if you are basically having an online course where what you're doing is you're watching a video, and then maybe you're doing some problem sets, well, that's not the most engaging style of learning. We kind of know that one-on-one -on -one tutoring is kind of the most engaging style of learning. And so if we're gonna really change things in the education space, it's not just take everything that I say, make a video of it, and put it on the internet. It somehow takes some aspect of, of, the, of the interactivity that I have with my students to somehow find a way of mimicking that. And for better or for worse, generative AI or the deep fake version of me, like that may be a, a, a way or a pathway towards something like that. And people are starting to ask that question. But, but it, I think it's going to be challenging because, of course, we have standards of education. And we want to make sure that we do, uh, do right and not do harm. And I think you can also imagine the harms of, of techniques like that. So let me give you just an example to, to tell you about scaling. So one of the most expensive things to do, apparently, for medical education is that you have doctors and they need to interact with, um, with model patients. So these are actors who are paid to pretend like they have certain ailments, and then that's a way that doctors can get trained to actually you know, improve their bedside manner or learn how to do diagnosis. And that's a very expensive part of medical education. But there are attempts to make AI versions of model patients. They're not perfect but allows you to do it at a much bigger scale. So something that otherwise would be cost prohibitive, yeah. now you can have something where you can actually interact with many, many more model patients. So that's maybe a, an example of something where the technology enables something that we can't do and then you have a chance of scaling up just because the human resources are expensive. It makes me uncomfortable to think of be, myself being replaced by a machine, but also it makes me a little bit uncomfortable about thinking about the relatively small number of students that I engage with in a semester. Now I engage with what, like 100 students per semester? A lot more than 100 people are interested in physics. And is there any way of doing that? But it, 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 it's going to be a, a dialogue and a, and a challenge to figure out how to do that yeah. at scale. Yeah. But I just add, I think the problem that you mentioned is one that is now increasingly being recognized. So kind of to avoid this sort of issue of balkanization of this, uh, this knowledge and finding uh, ways of really bringing things to scale. So it, it's a community problem. And, uh, and uh, in a lot of ways, challenging that community to be able to then share these resources in a way that's really meaningful and ultimately drives it to scale, I think is the challenge before us. Great, great. So um, let me just, uh, Sandeep, do you have a question? And then I'll go here. Yeah. And then Ben, too. Okay. Go ahead. Um,
probably a lot of fine businesses who ended up going to that job. You know, they went with him, and of course, he's very talented, and he won the Turing Award, the most prestigious Nobel Award in computer science, I think, of all time. Um, so, how would you make a case on for, for a position that's that important, that has a title of a big title, why they should hire a person with no other interest? Uh, hmm. uh, I think I, I, maybe I, I can start because I, I've been thinking about this quite a bit, and I think now it's a great time for physicists to shine. <laughs> we've been kind of in the shadow for quite some time. I mean, a lot of physics discoveries were done uh, maybe in, in, the, in the 20th century. The bulk of them, it was kind of a period of us being kind of a little bit in the shadow. But now it's time to come back and kind of shine because uh, we understand the laws of physics. We connect the dots. Uh, we come kind of from a different type of mindset. And again, we can bring more explainability, efficiency, and common sense into the kind of the current uh, chaotic world of AI. That, that's kind of my short answer to this. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm very bullish about it. <laughs> so I, I love the question, uh, but can you first get my students hired? <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I mean this seriously, I mean yeah. that, that we are training at our AI Institute these incredibly talented interdisciplinary experts who of course then go on to jobs in industry. So tell my faculty colleagues, you know, faculty searches, maybe higher in interdisciplinary spaces, but also talking to industry saying, the training that you get as a physicist is fantastic. And, uh, and so one of the things that we're trying to do at MIT is we, we have an interdisciplinary PhD program to try to get a credential in physics, statistics, and data science, so that at least you have that in your, in your credential and go out into jobs. But advertising, you know, okay, yes, the top position, that would be fantastic. But also advertising that the people coming out of our, of our our undergraduate programs coming out of our PhD programs are top-notch problem solvers. Uh, like that, let's communicate yeah, that first. And then once yeah. you get those people on the ground floor, then of course they're gonna rise all the way to the top, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and infusing with the physicist the ability to communicate persuasively and clearly <laughs> and to build consensus and teams. I, you know, so I, I think it's, it's, the, so it's the package deal, right? So it's that combination of physics plus business acumen and, and emotional intelligence and communication skills. So we've got to work on that whole package. Well, well, I was going to say it depends well, on the physicist. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it really depends on the physicist, right? <laughs> so that communication part, it, uh, the, the, the physicists, uh, understand problems and problem solving, and they can they can bring a certain um, perspective on what problems make sense to tackle with different approaches. Um, but this is a business, right? So that business acumen, that ability to understand, you know, the problems is fine, but but not get enamored with the science, but really understanding how to bring the science, the physics to the problems, being able to articulate that, number one, you understand the problem, that you have an, an, a new insight, uh, that you understand why this, this insight is better than you know, other approaches, and the value proposition if you're successful. Uh, that, that, is, that is a skill that needs to be learned to be able to, to yeah. you know, make those cases. And so, it, again, it depends on the physicist. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. So it's physics plus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you read Walter Isaacson's The Innovators, that, that, that story really comes through, that the people who are isolated in their basement making discoveries simultaneously or a little before somebody else that got much more recognized or not just didn't make it out there in, in the contribution world because they weren't in teams and they didn't have the plus. So this question here, yes. Yeah, hi. So this is not going to be the answer that you want to hear. Oh, no. 
Um, <laughs> so again, I'm a theoretical physicist. I'm a pencil and paper. You can think about my uh, my intellectual ancestors, right? And uh, uh, the, the the chauvinism of, of, of humans, thinking like, yes, it's human creativity. And I'm starting to think that maybe actually for breakthrough physics insights, that some a bit that we as humans need to start to think a little bit more like a computer. And why am I saying that? The ability of a computer to explore many, many different options, the ability to explore vast landscapes of possibilities, um, that is something that sometimes we don't take enough advantage of. So if you're thinking about discovery and you want to validate whether your discovery is true, uh, if you're really going to do like proper statistical inference, then you want to make sure that you have all the nuisance parameters, all the systematic uncertainties, those should be accounted for. Well, it's a, lot, it's a pain to do that. You know, it's, it's a lot of work to do that. But a computer can do it. A computer can analyze all those various possibilities. Maybe we need to be thinking more in that type of mindset. And so there's a part of me that wonders whether some of the, the, the pinnacles of human achievement, whether there's a version of that that could have been obtained through exhaustive search. And I go back and forth on this. You know, could Einstein's relativity have come from an optimization principle or not? Like, did it really need the understanding of the geometry of space-time, or was there some other way of getting to that, that insight? And there's a part of me that, that, that thinks that we might have gotten very lucky in the physics discoveries of the past, <laughs> that things were simple, that things were, were perturbative, that, that, there was, that you could start off with relatively simple rules. You could use kind of uh, uh, you know, basic physics insights to make progress. But it may be that the problems that we're facing are just intrinsically complex, and that maybe we need to be a little bit careful about trying to reduce things too far uh, to their simplest forms as physicists and maybe actually embrace some level of the complexity. And computers are pretty good at embracing complex systems and churning through a lot. So maybe we actually need to go the other direction than thinking about the future of, of creativity. And if I can add to this, uh, I think if you're talking from the technical perspective only, I think it's just a matter of time and probably not too far away, maybe within a decade, like for example, if you ask ourselves uh, 50 years ago, can a ship be cloned? The answer would be absolutely no, right? If you ask the same question today, yeah, it can be done. But why are we not doing this? Because there are all kind of uh, safeguards there, right? So we put all the safeguards on, on, the, on this type of technologies. I think similar to AI, I, I think uh, it depends how the system is designed. If the system is designed in such way from the beginning, from the architecture, that it behaves more like an assistant, then it's okay. If the system is allowed in a way to, to replace our type of way of decision, reasoning, and so on, then we might get in trouble. So I think it really, uh, the, the, the guidance of AI and the rules are becoming super important, like organizations like NIST and other yeah. type of organizations, they sh should step up now, the governments, because I think the technology part, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. just a matter of time. I think it becomes more, more a government issue than a technology issue. Yeah, and, and, uh, uh, and, and so th there's the, um, the, the patentable part of, of a discovery, but then you look at the wild landscape of copyrightable work and what then constitutes uh, you know, the beginning of one creative process and, and what, was the, what was the role of, uh, of AI or, or a machine uh, uh, assisted program. Uh, it's now kind of a race. I was talking about the use of artificial intelligence actually in the experimental design and discovery process. Mm -hmm. These are intrinsically human activities, and so we are in a very interesting uh, symbiosis now with the machine. Um, uh, of course, PTO and, and um, um, other uh, intellectual property offices around the world have uh, made certain policy decisions about uh, inventive activity and, and the role of the human inventor vis-a-vis -vis the, the machine. Uh, but in some ways, these become a bit artificial constructs right now. And so it's an evolving landscape that we're just on for the ride. If I can well, just real quickly add, that, so there are examples of where AI has discovered laws of physics, but it's really been a rediscovery of <coughs> laws yep. we already know. Right. But if it can do that, who's to say that we're not on the verge of discovering, you know, discovering something new? Um, <laughs> um, and I will say that uh, both in my portfolio when I was at DARPA and, and uh, some of the work that we're doing now, when you kind of just let AI do its thing, right, it can explore lots of different options with just some, I, w I want to design, a, you know, a um, heat exchanger that has these properties without the biases of what a heat exchanger looks like today. Mm -hmm. It comes up with some pretty creative 
um, you know, options. Mm -hmm. And when you pair that with well, where we have some you know, new ways of being ac actually being able to make these sorts of things and new materials, I think I think there's some promise there. That's great. Well, this has been just a tremendously exciting discussion. I've gotten the the word that we have to bring this to a close for our reception, at which everybody will be present. But I, I do want to give the last question to Vince Cerf. I mean, how the father of the internet, come on. We've got to give them <laughs> the opportunity to ask the last question of our panel. Here that's, you go. That's sort of like, you know, the Nobel Prize winners who think because they got the Nobel Prize, they know about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Second, with regard to the um, uh, exhaustive search, that's sort of like the monkeys and the typewriters. Did you remember Bob Newhart? That he's the, uh, uh, talking about the guy who was monitoring the monkeys. And he, he comes, he's walking along and he sees one and he says, hey, hey, Fred, I think I got something. Uh, to be or not to be, that is the Grisornin. <laughs> <laughs> There's an example from 1972. Uh, two of us got together and said, there's a paranoid simulator at Stanford University called Parrot. And there was a doctor program at MIT, it was also called ELISA, Joe Weizenbaum, trying to demonstrate how stupid artificial intelligence was in the 1960s. So we hooked the two of them together. And if you're interested in the dialogue that resulted, <laughs> Harry meets the doctor. <laughs> 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 um, honestly, I think we don't really and fully appreciate what the hell is going on with the large language models. We know that they are generative. Uh, we know that they also can hallucinate. But they do think something which is really quite interesting because they do bring together uh, some unexpected juxta juxtapositions as a result of the prompting. The thing is that these things don't have enough context. But there is a, a, con a concrete example of this. Uh, France and I probably have bios on uh, web pages that are adjacent, if not the same one. And the large language models ingest all the text. They don't have a clue that this piece is uh, France's bio and this other paragraph is my bio. And so when they're building this correlation matrix, this big, big tree, uh, they conflate factual material from our two bios. I tested this with an obituary. I asked it to write an obituary for me. I know that sounds you know, kind of like hot. <laughs> but, uh, but I figured it had there was stuff on the net about me and there's uh, lots of bios so the system would have learned the format. So it generated a nice 700 word bio, or sorry, Dr. Surf passed away, and then they gave a date, which I thought was way too soon. <laughs> 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 and, and, and then it talked about my career, and it gave me credit for stuff I didn't do, and it gave other people credit for stuff I did. And then it got to the family member part, and it made up family members with the I know I don't have. <laughs> and, and, and I'm trying to figure out, well, why is it doing that? And part of this is context. So we have a long ways to go. There's something very fundamental about what's happening with the large language models, though, it's important for us to appreciate. The first thing is that it is producing the verisimilitude of human discourse. It is responding as if we had asked it, if you were a human being, what would you say to this prompt? Mm -hmm. That's all it's doing. Mm -hmm. But hiding in there is some notion of knowledge. And the reason is that the statistics reflect real text that had meaning. And so there's a ghost in there that understands something. And the most the poignant example of that that I saw was one of our employees asked one of the chatbots, 
I suggest do something very simple. Reverse this string of random characters. And it, so it says, OK. And it produces the reverse string. And then unasked, it says, oh, by the way, here's a Python program that does that. Uh, and that just sort of stopped everybody saying, wait a minute, what just happened here? So I think we have an, an amazingly powerful tool. And for the USPTO, hmm. uh, without getting uh, you know too elevated out of your chair, imagine a period of time when we used to use slide rules to do calculations. And somebody comes along with a calculator that produces several orders of magnitude better accuracy. Would we say that the guy that used the calculator was somehow cheating and shouldn't be patentable because he didn't use a slide rule? Well, no. And so these tools are just tools for the most part. We just have to be smart enough to distinguish the hallucination from the vision. I know that's not a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you for letting me have That's a great <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to our panel. It's just great. Thank you. Thank you. We can't get up until we come up. So, I so we have oh, a reception. Hi. Yes, I, I would like to make a few remarks. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. And you can't get out of here without making a donation to the American Institute. Yeah, you said it. Well, on behalf of AIP Foundation, I would like to thank our esteemed panelists and our wonderful moderators. So please give them another yeah. round of applause. <laughs> Just fascinating conversation, which I hope you'll take out into the networking reception. But I just wanted to take a moment um, to say that AIP Foundation supports the mission of AIP by inspiring philanthropy that empowers the physical scientists to make the change in the world that we need. So I want to thank the donors um, out there and in the room tonight for your support of the scientific community, which is so important in helping us to answer tough questions and advance the physical sciences. Um, I encourage you all to make a gift to AIP Foundation. There will be a QR code <laughs> behind me um, to, to help us um, continue our mission of supporting the physical sciences and all these wonderful folks who are doing the work in the front lines. Um, and so with that, our live stream uh, program concludes and we welcome everyone in the room to step outside and enjoy the networking reception. Thank you again for participating. Thank you. Thank you.